Hi there. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi. So um, we have a few speakers today uh, with some time constraints uh, that we're trying to get into the first half an hour. Um, uh, so I, I want to just open promptly here and say uh, welcome all. Uh, this is a CNCF sponsored video, so the code of conduct does apply. Uh, please don't put anything in the chat uh, that, that would be in violation of that. Um, and with that, uh, we have a we have a fairly uh, full agenda today. Um, if anyone doesn't have a link to the doc, I will place that in the chat now. Feel free to, or please do sign in uh, and indicate your attendance. Um, I'm going to skip over administrative and things like that. There was a TOC meeting today um, uh, and I gave an update on the tag. Uh, it was the last for some of the TOC members, Liz Rice uh, and a few others. Uh, this was their last TOC meeting and elections are, are very, very soon here. Uh, so with that, I wanna hand it over to Catherine um, uh, from the Business Values Subcommittee and, and uh, take it away. Uh, after that, by the way, um, uh, I've slotted Pixie next because uh, I believe um, uh, somebody there has to leave uh, by the half hour and we'll leave the, the tail end of the meeting for the Bumblebee team. Um, okay, well, thanks, Matt, for um, inviting me. Um, so yeah, today I wanted to tell you a little bit about the CloudNet native glossary, because uh, apparently, is it is, the, is it too windy? I see some. No. Um, and it's a new CNCF project. And because Matt said that there is some interest in contributing um, in general to different projects. So I just want to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, I did do a little presentation, uh, very short. So for those who wanted to talk after, no worries. Um, OK. So you can find it basically at glossary.cncf.io. And, uh, oh no, it went one over. Um, so basically we're trying to create a glossary that explains all cloud native terms um, to engineers just getting started, uh, but also to people with no technical background, right? So we're really focusing on explaining things in very simple words that are accessible to anyone no tech tech jargon is um, is allowed. Um, sometimes they sneak a little bit in, and that's where we need uh, help, maybe to um, improve those um, terms as well. And as it turns out, that's actually really really hard, right? Explaining things in like explaining complex things in simple words is really challenging. Um, but it's also a way to really verify or kind of make sure that you really understand it, right? Because if you do manage to do that, you really kind of got it. Um, and it officially launched at KubeCon NA. Um, and um, so basically right now, so we officially launched at KubeCon NA and uh, are now right, really trying to focus on getting more contributors. And we're also trying to translate it into different languages. And so just wanted to maybe show it a little bit if you haven't seen it. Uh, oops. This is, uh, so this is the glossary, right? You have like all these different terms here. We started with 50 terms and all of them try to explain or kind of broken down into what it is, the problem that it addresses and how it helps. Um, if you're interested in contributing, we created a contributor, a how to contribute guide, uh, the different ways you can contribute. We have uh, Slack uh, channels and so on. And here, like we even made it for people who are not at all technical. It's explained. In, in, in details as well. So uh, to make it accessible, because you don't necessarily have to be um, um, familiar with uh, GitHub to contribute if you understand it technically. Uh, and then um, we're also uh, translating it currently. And you can find the stat style guide here. And all pages have, all the terms have uh, the ability to be edited here. It will lead you right into the GitHub repository tons of issues here. Uh, people are super active right now, which is very, very exciting. Uh, again, we just, we literally just 
launched it in Kipan NA, and we're seeing lots of people helping each other on Slack, which I did not expect at all. And, um, and um, yeah, I mean, like, uh, it's very active and also on the um, translation part. So if you're interested, this is the last slide. If you're interested, um, you can um, you can submit new terms. Like if you just have ideas of things that you see that are missing, that's like the easiest thing, just submit an issue. You can also uh, create a new term, like uh, create a PR. You can improve existing ones. Uh, as, um, as I mentioned, we were a very small team with the first 50 terms. Uh, we had a few contributions, but we really were, I think we had like a goal of creating three, two, two terms per week. So we really, it was a lot of work to get to coupon NA and sometimes we may not have been um, complied with our own rule of simplicity. Uh, and then you can also help translate the glossary into your, na your native language. We have currently existing teams for Korean, Portuguese, Italian, Spanish, um, Arabic, uh, Bengali, and Hindi. And these are the active ones. We have some other ones that have started, that who started creating it, uh, but they haven't been that active. But you can also create your own team if, if the language, if there's no team for your language as well. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. If, if anyone is interested, uh, the first step would really be to, um, to, um, to, join, um, to join the glossary, uh, uh, the glossary channel. Uh, we also have the glossary localizations channel on the CNCF uh, Slack if you're interested in, in translating it. Um, again, uh, it is very active. People are engaging a lot. Um, so it's a great place to ask questions, get help or oh, whatever, um, um, you, however you want to engage with the community. And um, yeah, just that, that would be how to get started. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if you could also uh, uh, cover, if, there, if you have time, uh, what is the business value subcommittee? Uh, and, oh. and how does that fit into the CNCF and tags and, and the ontology mm -hmm. uh, of all of that? Yeah, so it all started with the Business Value Subcommittee, um, where I am co-chair with um, Jason Morton. Um, and the idea was to create content or resources for people who are not technical. Well, one of the things that we've realized, of course, as you all know, is that cloud native is becoming more mainstream. More and more people are touched by it that are not necessarily technical, right? Like, these are, like, huge... Uh, projects like, for instance, mi migrating your application to microservices is a huge, uh, huge project, costs million of dollar, millions of dollars potentially, and so the C-suite is involved in that. So a lot of people need to understand it. But like, if you look at the content on there, it's always very much targeted towards people with technical backgrounds. So it's really difficult to understand what it, what this is all about. So we um, started the business value subcommittee with the goal of creating. Um, content for that target audience, like making it more accessible to anyone, no matter what background they have. Uh, and before starting anything else, we thought like, okay, if we start creating content, we need to first agree on the different terms, because um, otherwise it's gonna be very difficult. Um, and also we're always going to, we're gonna refer back to Kubernetes containers, APIs over and over again. So. Uh, we decided the first project should should be a glossary where we explain all these terms and then we can create more content and then um, link to that specific definition easily and don't have to explain it over and over again. Um, so it was supposed to be this little kind of thing that we wanted to do to start something else, but it turned to be a lot more, uh, a lot bigger than uh, we thought it would be. And like, um, yeah, now it's really flourishing with yeah, lots of contributors uh, so far, but that's how it fits in. So we're, we're also, the goal is also to create more things for the business value subcommittee. So there, this is one project and we're working on um, another one, which is explaining, we're trying to create a um, comparison table for uh, CNCF. We're gonna start with CNCF projects and then uh, opening it up for different uh, open source projects where uh, projects can, uh, there's a framework where projects can explain uh, or say what they are, what are the most important features, a uh, short description and so on. Uh, because one of the issues that we realized is that it's really hard to, it's really hard 
for users to understand, to have an overview of what projects exist. There's a lot of content, but it's always a deep dive, but kind of understanding or getting a sense of, um, of what, uh, what these, each project is on a high level and then deciding where you want to dig deeper, that kind of content is missing. And another thing that we created is also the CNCF landscape guide. If you, so if you go into the landscape right now, there's a little guide that explains the landscape. So that's part of the business value subcommittee as well. So if you have any ideas, come join us. Thank you. Are there any questions uh, before we move on? Okay. Uh, with that, I think next, thank you, Catherine, uh, very much. Um, I've captured some notes, and if I could get this, the link to your slides offline, uh, or if you want to paste them into the meeting notes, that'd be awesome uh, for the folks that couldn't be here today. Um, next up is an update from Pixie. Um, and to provide some context, uh, Bumblebee uh, is a project that was uh, that we're going to talk about, uh, that the folks will talk about uh, after. Uh, Pixie uh, that is uh, centered around uh, eBPF and providing developer tooling, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to misstate uh, the project goals. Uh, but uh, Pixie uh, last uh, came to the tag uh, last year in May, I believe, and kind of uh, did a bit of a show and tell. And so, uh, as a CNCF uh, project that's engaged with eBPF as part of the part of the project, um, in addition to just get an update. Uh, um, yeah, we thought it, it kind of fit. I'm on mute. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so I, I'm Zane, um, and I'm one of the project maintainers of Pixie. Uh, for, for just some longer term context, uh, Pixie was built by uh, Pixie Labs, uh, where I was a co founder and CEO. We actually got acquired by New Relic um, in 2020. And we open sourced uh, Pixie and contributed it to the CNCF. And we're now a sandbox project and hoping to, um, you know, uh, become like an incubating project and, and move on in, in the, the CNCF project lifecycle. Uh, so I didn't, I don't have any like formal slides or anything prepared today. So I'll just talk through it. I'm actually hoping that, you know, moving forward, if we can have an update on Pixie every so often in this meeting, uh, we can actually have some slides put together um, give kind of overviews of what we're working on, what we plan to do. Uh, but for folks that are not like really familiar with it, uh, Pixie is a Kubernetes observability system, uh, which basically um, uses eBPF to capture data um, and uses all the Kubernetes metadata to actually help like make it digestible. Um, so we can take all the eBPF data and present it to you as in, you know, here's the traffic from this service and here's the actual HTTP request bodies. And on top of that, we have this layer that's you know, based on top of pandas to be able to work with and analyze the data. So partly what we're trying to do with Pixie is make it very easy to capture data, but also very easy to build workflows out that will then allow you to you know, do something with your system. So for example, um, at the last KubeCon, uh, we, had, um, we had a demo on how to actually gather metrics from Pixie, like actually message information, and then use that to do pod auto scaling. Um, and we can take a look at like pretty detailed information around, um, you know, around actual content of the messages to, to determine that. Uh, another thing is, you know, doing things like SQL injection and attack detection. So we really, we really plan to be like kind of like a horizontal layer that can capture the data and present it for like different use cases. And we have this concept of scripts that you can actually run. Um, in real time on your system to be able to process this information. So that's where we're at. Um, like I said, you know, we're still a very, very new project. Um, it, and we're just starting to get to the point where we're accepting external contributions and moving into larger systems. Um, you know, to be, to be completely upfront, we haven't even moved all of our issue tracking into GitHub yet, which is something that we're planning to do and release our public roadmap. <laughs> Um, I, I was wondering if you might, um, you, you, if you or Michelle could speak to what it's been like to build uh, an eBPF, you know, based solution uh, with the tooling that has existed for quite a long time and then some of it more recent. Like, could you maybe paint a picture of, you know, was that an easy thing, a, a hard thing? Um, you know, what, what was the experience around the, the state of the art with tools and, 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 and things like that? Um, yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we've always done um, 
with Pixie is, you know, we, we always build out these simple prototypes of eBPF. And I think our biggest challenge has always been taking something simple that works in eBPF and making it robust and reliable across many, many different machines and configurations and operating systems. Um, you know, we still require, I, I think like 4.12 is our minimum kernel version that we require. Um, Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that is, uh, that is our, our minimum requirement right now, maybe it's 4.14. Um, but you know, we, we try not to track the latest kernel version because you go to a lot of deployments, people don't have that. Um, like a lot of people don't run the latest, greatest systems. Um, so part of our challenge has always been like trying to get this deployed and running reliably without losing data or without having like some, you know, insane resource consumption. Um, actually that's part of the biggest battle we're fighting with Pixie right now, uh, that we're hoping to resolve is just our resource consumption is, is relatively high for an observability system. Um, so in terms of challenges, I'd say, you know, the tooling for eBPF is not particularly friendly. Uh, you can get things running. It's hard to productionize them. And after you productionize them, you then run into other issues like, okay, well, maybe the resource consumption is too high. How do we actually deal with the buffer sizes? If the buffer sizes are too small, you start losing data. If the buffer sizes are too big. You consume too much memory. Uh, you know, people familiar with eBPF here were probably like, oh yeah, I understand how this works. Um, and what the challenges are over there. Um, so a lot of our stuff has just been around like tweaking things and making things work out. Um, we added a new capability to Pixie last year uh, that allows you to do continuous profiling of applications using eBPF. And, you know, it was relatively easy to get something working, but getting that working reliably at scale, um, you know, with binaries that, you know, sometimes like people building static binaries, the binaries can be like three, 400 megabytes that could actually introduce a significant amount of memory overhead when we're trying to like resolve addresses and stuff inside of that binary. Um, so little, little details like that with eBPF and other observable A systems tend to be the things that blow up. Um, we found it like relatively quick to actually get something, some prototype working, but very, very difficult to make it reliable at scale. And are you uh, one question? Are you an agnostic to the to the platform? So it's Linux, but it does not have to be Kubernetes, right? So as of today, uh, Pixie needs to run on a Kubernetes machine. Um, we plan to remove that limitation. So the way we think about Pixie is that there is a data system, and then there is a data collection stuff. The data system will most likely require Kubernetes for the foreseeable future. But we will allow like our PEMs, which is all the Pixie Edge modules, to be able to run either on a Linux node or on a Kubernetes node. Um, that's on a roadmap to be able to support like generic Linux machines. Um, so we'll probably have that in the next you know, next uh, couple of months, next few months. The challenge, of course, is that in Kubernetes, you get this very rich metadata for, for free, which you won't necessarily get if you're running on some like arbitrary Linux machine. So, you know, and if you use Pixie, we can go from here is a message that we saw associated with this process ID to this container to this service to whatever, right? And we build the entire system up. If you're running on an arbitrary Linux machine, that data is just not non existent. Thanks. Um, and I'll paste the link to our project over here um, for folks over here to see. And then it is. Get up. Yep. Cool. Um, I just realized I'm signed in as tag observability because I was uploading videos. So uh, my name is Matt, not tag observability. Um, uh, are, are there any questions for, for the Pixie folks or, or any additional updates? Uh, I know we're trying to, we had some time pressure, uh, but uh, before we move on to Bumblebee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Zane and Michelle. I think Lynn, you're up. Hey guys, we are so excited to be here. In fact, I'm going to introduce my coworker, Lawrence, because he is one of the core maintainers on Bumblebee. He can explain Bumblebee way better than me. So Lawrence, uh, go ahead. 
All right. Uh, thanks, Lynn. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Lawrence. Um, and like Lynn said, I'm one of the core maintainers of Bumblebee. Um, right now, Bumblebee is a very early project. So uh, I would say it's not quite to where, you know, maintaining maintenance is a lot of work. Um, but we are very excited about the project. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about it. Let me go ahead and share my screen. So I have uh, some slides that I kind of repurposed um, that hopefully you should be able to see my screen. Um, I'll run through these fairly quickly, um, but just to kind of give a sense of what Bumblebee is. So Bumblebee, th let me get into slideshow. This, uh, this description comes directly from the readme, um, but it does a pretty good job of capturing it. So Bumblebee intends to help run, build, run, distribute eBPF programs using OCI images. It allows you to focus on writing eBPF code while taking care of the user space components, automatically exposing your data as metrics or logs. Um, so like we just heard, you know, a very accurate, sta accurate statement from the Pixie folks, you know, writing BPF code is hard. Um, and so one of the goals of Bumblebee, and Matt, I think you did a good job of explaining at the beginning, you know, one of the, one of the core aspects of Bumblebee is the developer tooling component. Um, and so the observability is kind of something that, you know, we want to help solve observability, but we all also want to help solve the challenge of running uh, or writing BPF code. Um, and as far as writing BPF code goes, you know, a lot of the existing tools like BCC and so on, um, that, that, that requires you to be able to compile your, your BPF code on the fly on the system that you want to run your probes or, you know, whatever it is that you're running, you need to be able to compile that on the fly. And so libbpf, which is, um, you know, the in, in tree, in kernel uh, kind of, uh, Basically, it's it's a library that's trying to abstract away some of that and allow you to you know write BPF code uh, programs that can run on any version of the kernel that supports uh, BTF, uh, which is BPF type format. Um, and so with Bumblebee, we kind of saw that as an opportunity to help simplify the user developer experience even more so. And so Bumblebee depends on libbpf, and what we try to do is allow you to write libbpf compatible code and only that. Um, so in other words. Right now, at least, the common use case when you're actually writing code, um, you know, there are other tools like BPF Trace and Pixie is a good example as, where, as well, where you kind of abstract away the actual BPF code, which in a lot of cases is, is great. Um, but there are some times where you want to actually write BPF code, and especially just for learning, right? You want to be able to write programs that interact with the kernel and you kind of get that uh, feedback of, you know, writing some code and executing it, seeing the, you know, tracing data or whatever it is that you're looking for. And so with, with, um, with Bumblebee, we tried to abstract away the user space component. So with the libbpf program, you, you write your probes or your, your trace points or whatever the, pro, the BPF program is, you need to um, write that. You need to also write the user space code, which will load the program into the kernel, create the BPF maps, which is how your program talks to you know, user space and you actually get the data out. You need to load that into the kernel. You need to attach it to the um, to whatever function. You know, if it's a K probe or a trace point or whatever it is, and then you need to actually um, you know extract that data, format it, and output it. And so, in a lot of cases, um, you know, unless you're writing a very sophisticated uh, program, a lot of cases that that user space component is essentially boilerplate. And so, one of the things that Bumblebee also tries to solve is to abstract that away to where all you really need to do is write your BPF code that's interacting with the kernel. And then the, the user space uh, kind of runner of Bumblebee will be able to dynamically determine those types of the data that you're storing and then automatically display it. You know, right now we have a kind of a TUI, um, a text you, you know, interface that shows um, you know, what is in your, in your maps. But it, we also output metrics as Prometheus in Prometheus format right now automatically based on those types. Um, and so it's a lot easier to see. Uh, we'll get into a demo if time permits. Uh, and I have some slides that kind of show it a little bit more. But really, it, again, it's trying to reduce the complexity of get, getting started and then iterating on your, your BPF programs. Um, and then the last point here is to easily push, pull, and run BPF programs from OCI compliant registries. So you know, take everything that we just said. You write your code. Um, you don't have to write the user space component. But then you can package that up 
in an OCI image, which means that you can do things like push it to a say GitHub container registry or pull it from GitHub container registry. And that way it's a lot easier to kind of share, distribute, um, you know, iterate on your programs. Um, so for example, with Bumblebee, we have a few examples. Uh, we need to add a lot more, but we have a few examples that are stored in our GitHub container registry. So what we can look at here is with, if you have the B CLI, you can just do a B run with, and then, you know, you specify the image and it will pull that from the registry and run it automatically. Um, so kind of did the distribution and workflow as far as like, you know, CI right today is all in cloud native world is all built on building your images, pushing them to registry and then pulling them in your cluster, for example. Right. So this is trying to kind of mimic that environment to allow you to easily, you know, kind of fit into your existing workflows. Um, okay. So that's kind of the overview. Um, these are some diagrams that hopefully help, uh, the build process again, we, so I don't think I did a good job explaining this. The, the build is we have a container, a build container that really all it does is package kind of the, the tooling you need to build libvpf uh, programs. So things like uh, LLVM and Clang, um, the headers. So if you're using libvpf, you, you commonly will use something called VM Linux, which is kind of the, the abstracted types from the kernel. And that's what allows you to run on any kernel that supports BTF. Um, but all of that is kind of packaged in a container to make it easy to get started. You know, there, there's nothing too special going on in there but it does reduce the barrier of entry, at least that, at least we believe so. Um, so if you were to do like a B build and you have your BPF code, um, and again, only your BPF code, you do a B build BPF.C or whatever your file is. And then you give this, uh, in this example, it's my underscore BPF uh, V1 tag. And that's the OCI image that will contain your actual probe or you know whatever your program does. Um, so, we use that container, that build container to compile it to the BPF elf representation and then package that in the OCI image that you can then use to push, you know, to whatever registry you want. Um, then, so yeah, this is the push, right? So in this example, this is the GitHub container registry. Um, so you can do a B push and then that will push the actual OCI image with your uh, program to the registry and then running it you can just do a B run, you know, give that same image name uh, and it will pull your image. And now you have that essentially in like your local store, um, you know, similar to like when you're pulling Docker images, right? And then, then it goes through kind of the standard um, loading and kind of bootstrapping of a BPF program where you create the maps you need, load the program into the kernel, uh, attach it to the right, the hook point, um, and then it will read the, uh, so your BPF program is going to update your maps. And then based on some conventions that we have, you know, really it's just the section name, which we'll see here in a second, it will dynamically read those maps and output the data either as a, you know, in a pretty text interface in your, in your terminal or as metrics or both. Um, and we also, we, the, the user interface is kind of just like a, you know, a nice, it, it's, it's a cool getting started tool. Um, you can also shut that off and, you know, we have plans to maybe be able to make it like a standard output. So, you know, if you want it running in a container or whatever else. Um, but right now, really the, the core functionality is that based on the types of data that you're putting into your maps, we can dynamically determine that using BTF, just like the kernel, did, you know, just like the libbpf uses BTF types to allow you to to run on any version that, of the kernel that supports BTF, we use that BTF type of your, your data that you're putting into your map to be able to dynamically understand the, the essentially the data structure. And that's how we can kind of dynamically print out in the correct format what you are watching in your program. And so um, this kind of goes into it. It might be a little, I don't know how, how far you know, into it we want to get, but really the core part here is what I was just talking about as far as the types go. So on the left, this is an example of um, basically if we're writing some BPF code to do uh, track TCP connections, we can use a hash map uh, B, to create a BPF map of a hash map type. And in that we want to store, for example, the source address and the destination address, which would be up here. And those are stored as this IPv4 address 
which is, it's really just a type definition of the standard representation of an IP address. But what this gives us is that this type, if you look at the map definition, we call out the type here and the, the struct is passed in as the, that's the key of your hash map. And so because we know what struct, what the format of that struct is, later on when we actually run and um, read that data, we can, we know that the type is an IPv4 address so we can format it appropriately. Um, and then you, your BPF code doesn't really change. This is pretty consistent across, um, especially the LibBPF style uh, code, but really, you know, you're just read, you're getting some, you're getting a socket address essentially from an event and putting it into the map. And then that's it. B will be able to, Bumblebee will be able to read that data. So to actually kind of see it in action, again, taking that, that data type, so when you do a B run, and in this case, this is a hash map TCP connect program that I kind of just you know, built and I'm running it. And so you can see this uh, destination address as D adder, source address as S adder. These types come directly from our struct of the key type of that hash map. And so we kind of infer this again, because of the type information in the BPF program. And that's the same type information that libbpf uses to kind of allow you to do the compile one, once run everywhere. So we know that a D adder and an S adder are your uh, IPv4, and we can render that out in our UI accordingly. And then one of the other things that we can do is, so this section, um, typically this would be like dot maps. And that would say that, you know, this is a map, this is a BPF map. And that's how loaders, that's how BPF loaders know that, okay, I need to create this as a map in the kernel. Um, this is what I'm going to use to store my data in my program. There's a convention that we added where, you know, for example, in this case, we have a dot counter uh, suffix. And that is specific to B, specific to Bum Bumblebee. And that tells us that we want to watch this map, but we also want to export metrics as a counter. And so in our UI, you can see that there's a value feel, uh, column and that column contains the count of whatever. So like every time that an event is sent with the same destination and source address, we can increment a counter, right? And so for example, in this case, uh, the source address of this, you know, the machine that I'm on to this 169254 IP address, when I took the screenshot, right? That had been, that a connection had been established to this tuple 14 times, right? And so we can kind of dynamically do that and keep track of that. And so you get the output here on your UI, but then the other cool thing that we can do um, is export this as metrics. And since the, the user space kind of B CLI is written in Golang, we get a lot of stuff easier than if we were to write this in C, for example, right? So we can, in this case, hook into Prometheus libraries and export that same data that we were just looking at as Prometheus metrics. So this is a table graph of that. And then here's the actual graph, you know, and this is just using Prometheus, right? I just am scraping the metrics from the, the B tool. And, you know, I can do things like generate Prometheus metrics. And then, you know, you could use Grafana or whatever you want to actually graph it out. And so that's pretty much it as far as the slides go. Um, I don't know if there are any questions, <coughs> any comments. If not, I'm happy to show a quick demo if we want or up for whatever. So I noticed in the meeting minutes, there is a, somebody made a comment about Apache 2.0, not CNCF. So that's actually a pretty interesting comment. It is Apache license as you discover, um, as far as the project, uh, not in CNCF today, but it's something we are actively looking at. Uh, yeah, I, I put that there just for, for context. Um, so part of the charter and the, 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 the role of the, the, the technical advisory group here uh, is to uh, give feedback to the, you know, to, to do the things we do, but part of that is giving feedback to the technical oversight committee uh, to identify gaps in the ecosystem or things that are open source, but not in the CNCF versus uh, projects that are already in the, in the, in the CNCF. Um, umbrella, uh, if you will. So um, uh, yeah, that, 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 that's, that, that's the context. So 
um, you know, where, when, when, when I, uh, when I saw the Bumblebee, um, had, you know, when that's all had open source the project, um, you know, that's sort of, that's in the, in the, in the domain that, that we focus on. So, so that, that, that's the context there, but that's, that's great to know that, um, uh, uh, you're, you're thinking about it in those terms. Yeah, it's t certainly, and we would uh, appreciate your feedback, Matt. You know, if there are certain checkboxes we haven't met in preparation for, you know, position this as a CNCF sandbox project, we would love to hear. Sure, I, I think that's probably outside the scope of, of this meeting. Yeah. Um, um, and and I may or may not be the right the right person, but um. Uh, yeah, we, we can we can talk offline. There, there's a well-formed process that, that sometimes involves this group, but oftentimes doesn't. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I think I think the folks that are on the call or, or more, and or some of the folks that might see this video later uh, are really the right set of people that that if you're looking for feedback, you know, um, uh, I'm a facilitator here. <laughs> um, gotcha. The main experts, yeah. you know. Um, I have a small question because um, I've used a Cloudflare project called uh, the DP, DP, P, um, DBPF exporter, sorry, uh, where you could uh, build your BPF program in C and then there is a structure that will convert the data um, of your uh, BPF maps into Prometheus exporters directly. Um, so my feedback from the cloud first is was great it was an awesome product but it was very hard to configure it uh, and very inconsistent like mentioned before on the various uh, um, uh, systems where you run that that, uh, that project and um, I would be very interested if you can share any links because I would like I definitely want to have a try on this one um, to compare it so that will be for me like a a, a, a B test to compare my experience between the Cloudflare uh, exporter and uh, the, and your technology because it's, it's very interesting. But uh, now for now, I, I, I'm i very hard because I need to play. Uh, I, I'm very hard to understand what, what you provide extra compared to what Cloudflare provided a couple of years back. Uh, perhaps that might make sense. That might be a perfect segue to uh, uh, your offer, Lawrence, around doing a demo. Um, uh, if if that's something you'd like to do, uh, if if it's not, uh, not, you tell me. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. Um, I do. What was the pro The oh, Cloudflare's eBPF exporter. Okay, I see it in the in the chat now. Um, okay, yeah, that let, we can definitely do a demo. I, I think as far as the Prometheus part goes, there's probably not a whole lot of difference. Um, I actually am not too familiar with that one. I'm going to open that tab so I can look at it after this. Um, but the, so, you know, if they're, I'm assuming they're, they're taking some data from an eBPF program and exporting it as Prometheus metrics. So in that case, you know, there's not a whole lot of difference there. Um, yeah, I but think they are based on the BCC, which, uh, we are based on a modern BPF. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So this, yeah, I'll definitely need to kind of do my own A-B testing as well on that <laughs> to understand this one a little bit more. Um, but I think the other kind of components as far as the, really the, the OCI kind of packaging of the BPF probe or trace point or whatever it is, is, is one difference. And then um, also the, just the, the abstracted, hopefully simplified build process for libbpf compatible programs. Um, but yeah, maybe a demo will help. You know, I, I, I definitely want to dig more into this eBPF exporter though. Um, but really kind of the, the, I guess the, one of the most helpful parts of it is really the, the OCI kind of, at, at, the OCI compatible workflow. And so, you know, I have B downloaded. Um, I use this, uh, let me make this a little bit bigger. I use this install script here um, as most things nowadays have, uh, but basically, so I have a B, I have my B uh, binary. So if I were, let me make this a little bit bigger too. Um, so I have the binary here on my system. This is just a, uh, this is actually a Debian box, but you know, any, any again, any Linux uh, machine that supports VTF, which I think was 5.4, 
5 or 5.4 and newer. Um, but so I, what I, what I'll, the first thing kind of I'll do as far as like uh, a demo goes, this example here that's on the um, README is pretty cool. So this is kind of a more, I guess, sophisticated version of the, the, of the BPF program that I was showing in the slides. And so in this case, I'm using sudo to run it uh, just because, you know, to load uh, BPF programs is a uh, privileged action. We have some docs where, you know, you can use capabilities to do this. You don't have to do everything as sudo. Um, either way, for this example, I'm just going to do sudo. Uh, but all I'm going to do here is uh, b, b run and then this TCP connect program, uh, which is on our uh, solo IO Bumblebee GitHub container registry. And then I'm just going to pull the, the B version um, from the CLI so that I pull down the version. That's not necessarily a requirement. You know, I can just use whatever version, um, but this just kind of makes the, the copy paste easier. But anyway, so let's go ahead and run that. Oh, it's because of the, yeah. So we also have this <laughs> documented, uh, where is it? Yeah, so because my path, I didn't update it for sudo. So I just need to get my path from uh, my local or from my current user. Okay, so it pulled the program down and you can actually see that up here, right? So we're doing Bumblebee TCP connect 0010. And I actually, you know, there's actually, I guess something going on in my system where I'm talking to 142251695. And so there's, there's two tables here uh, because there are two maps that are being uh, watched, I guess, by B. Uh, so this top one is uh, an events ring, which is really using the ring buffer uh, BPF uh, map. And so this doesn't have the value, right? Because this is just essentially a stream of events. So as connects happen, you know, we'll just output them here. Um, and again, the, the, the formatting comes from the types that are represented in the maps, right? So again, I've only, we only have BPF code for this and all of this is inferred from that essentially. Um, and then the hash is kind of what I was talking about in the slides where this is actually counter. So this counter um, will, you know, this will keep track of, of the count of events as they come in. So I should have another, yeah. So here at the bottom, what I'll do, make this bigger. I'm just going to, you know, send some requests to this 1.1.1, right? And I come back to my, my reader. And so I have, you know, a stream of events and I have an updated uh, field here, which also has the, you know, I guess I did that seven times, right? And then, so that, that's, again, you know, all I did was be run and then pull down the image, right? So that that's one of the things that hopefully kind of makes it, uh, easy to share because, you know, you could also do this internally with folks on your team using your internal registry, whatever. Um, and then the other thing that I can show really quickly, uh, we can look at the code if we want, um, but I do have uh, a port forward going that can show um, basically that the metric aspect of it, which again, I, I definitely want to dig into that uh, Cloudflare's tool. But if I go to Prometheus that I have running on the system, um, let me make sure that I have the targets hooked up. Yeah, so this is just running locally and it's pointing to um, the metrics endpoint of my runner. So, you know, while I'm running this and, you know, getting data here in the UI or whatever, I can also get the, metri the data as a Prometheus metrics. Uh, so, all right, so if I look at the hash, this will be essentially in tune with what we're seeing here, right? And you can build graphs and so on. Um, and then one of the things, I guess we have a little bit of time left, you know, we can try and do some live coding. Um, what I can do is basically, uh, you know, we could just to show, I guess, um, let's go ahead and so this is actually the exact example that I'm running here. Um, so from a code perspective, this file is really it. Um, you know, 116 lines of BPF code and that's it. That just gets built into the program and then everything else kind of taken care of for you. Um, this is the, uh, the maps that we were talking about, or sorry, not this one. You can see that. So this is dot maps. This is standard BPF map 
there's nothing special about this. This is just used for kind of accounting, right? In, in the actual code, the actual ones that we care about are the ones that at least from the B perspective um, are, have the, you know, the dot counter suffix. Um, so in this case, we have a dot counter for the hash map. And then we also have a dot counter for the ring buff. Um, and actually that's one of the things that I don't think I mentioned. So on the, on the ring buff, basically if you're using a, a ring buffer or any kind of streaming, essentially, we don't track the values here, but we do have, uh, we do actually export that as um, metrics. So if I were to, you can see that I actually have another metric for uh, events ring. So I'm actually also getting counter-based metrics for uh, the ring buffer as well. Um, but anyway, so going back to the code. So, you know, this is my kind of accounting structure. This is where the scratch work is done to pass data around within the program. But these dot counters are what is actually supposed to be exported. Uh, Matt, I see you have a question. Yeah, just as, as we're running out of time, uh, I just want to make sure I understand what I'm seeing. Uh, so at, at, a, at a high level, this is, is, it, is it a true statement that you're, you're targeting interactive development workflows uh, or, or iterative you know, ex exploratory workflows? Like I, I noticed the, the UI that, that looks a little bit like canines you know, sort of the cursive exactly. style of the UI. Uh, is that like one mode to write this? And then, you know, you, you would foresee B being used uh, uh, from the context of other projects or, or code that, you know, where, where you're able to leverage this, this distribution mechanism for the BPF stuff. Uh, B, BPF portions around updates, but um, it's embeddable or is this, is this really focused at, as an interactive sort of debugging diagnostic um, scenarios? Yeah, it, it, that's a great question. I, I would say that primarily right now, it would be more iterative, interactive style. You know, it really, I, I would say it's debugging, but I would say even more so it's iterative learning eBPF and actually writing BPF code. Um, because, you know, if, if you want to kind of, you know, track a new piece of data, essentially from the kernel structures, this is a quick way of getting feedback where all you have to do really is add a new field to your struct and you know, populate it with however you want in your code, in your BPF code. You don't have to worry about building that into the, like exp exposing it as data, whatever you want. It's really quick feedback cycle as far as actual development yeah. goes. I think looking cool. forward, the actual distribution, um, you know, one of the things that you could do is, uh, one of the things that, you know, Tolo we've had success with is for example, with Wasm, passing around Wasm filters for Envoy as OCI images. So the OCI image aspect is another really interesting component as far as distribution of artifacts. And so, you know, this could potentially open the doors for distributing BPF programs purely as the programs in kind of a, you know, more cloud native way, if you will, right? Sure. So I think, I think the roadmap is still a little open-ended and it really depends on kind of the user feedback we get. Um, so. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my only, my last question is, um, you know, uh, for, for folks here or for folks that will watch us later, uh, if folks are interested in contributing, where should they reach out? Or, or maybe you could talk briefly in the remaining time, you know, um, uh, about what are areas where, where you're actually seeking contribution or are you more seeking feedback? Like what are your aims uh, uh, in terms of community engagement at this time for the Bumblebee project? Okay, yeah, great question. Um, maybe I'll take a stab at it and then Lynn, if you wanna add some thoughts as well to that yeah. one. Um, so if you're interested, come check us out on GitHub. Uh, I think we have the links in the notes. And if not, it's just solo.io solo -io slash Bumblebee. Uh, we have a handful of issues. Contributions are welcome. Um, feedback is very, very welcome. So if, if you think that there's a use case that, that uh, you know, this would help with, please let us know. Uh, we also have a Slack that you can join um, that there's a link on the readme. Um, really just, you know, at this point, any thoughts, comments, feedback, issues, PRs, everything I think is welcome at this point. Um, Lynn, maybe you can give a more concise uh, message. Yeah, I mean, me on that. 
totally agree with you. So check out bumblebee.io, by the way, I sent you the Slack yeah. message. Uh, we have that website in English and also Chinese because one of our contributors help us translate to Chinese. So in from bumblebee.io, you will be able to join our Slack and directly to the Bumblebee channel. So that's where you can have discussions. The feedback such as uh, how is your guys different from Cloudflare eBPF exporter, those are really interesting to us. Uh, certainly we welcome your contribution in any type of format, whether it's, uh, you know, produce education material for us. Uh, if you think this is a great for learning eBPF, to you know, attending our workshop, which we're going to have our first workshop at SoloCon to teach people eBPF through Bumblebee or submit PR, like Lauren said, right? GitHub issues, open issues, submit PR, just engage with us. Uh, we would really appreciate this. So the way I'm thinking Bumblebee is uh, just to add what Laura and, and Matt to your question, you know, an easy way to think about it, think about Docker, right? What Docker CLI brings to you to help you build Docker images, to help you publish that images to the registry and to help your friend, your coworkers to be able to reuse your images. That's the vision we set for Bumblebee for eBPF. We want to really bring this simple experience like Docker CI to uh, eBPF through Bumblebee. So using Bumblebee, you can, using the BACLI that Lauren's demo, right? So you can build your eBPF program, you can publish it, you can consume and run somebody else eBPF program as OCI images. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, at some point, we'll get kicked off because Zoom. <laughs> uh, uh, but thank you for everyone that, that presented. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, feel free to engage us on our Slack or our website at GitHub. OK. Uh, well, I guess if there's nothing else with that, thanks for uh, uh, attending and find us at uh, Tag Observability on CNCF Slack, uh, reach out directly, uh, or see you in GitHub issues. <laughs> um, thanks. Thanks so Thank much. You.